Let me put it this way. I, I, like, I like to think that God is real. I don't believe in God because the idea that an omniscient, loving being would judge me who is mortal and ignorant based on a few years' experience, I find to be rather a cruel thought. All the power that God has, he, she, it has given to me. So we're definitely one. Uh, I hope I hope there's there's something else out there. It'd be, it'd be fun to experience either that or we're all just evolved apes. Um, I was raised atheist. I don't believe in a higher power, but I also don't claim to know everything about the world. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there is one. I just pretend, I guess, and hope that there's something else out there. Well, as you saw, we're in uh, week two of a series called Explore God. Not just us, but 850 churches around the Chicagoland area exploring these seven questions. Big, big questions. Last week, does life have a purpose? And this week, is there a God? 30 minutes, the existence of God. Yeah, like the, that's sort of arrogant. I realize that we're not going to resolve that, but we're going to try to drive at the heart of the Christian worldview answer to that question. I had a friend recently, um, well, recently in the last couple of years, say to me, um, uh, we grew up together in, in high school, and he found out that I was a pastor, and he was understandably shocked. <laughs> and we reconnected. Uh, it's an interesting story how we reconnected, but he said, you know, don't you ever think about the existence of God that, that you believe in this stuff because you grew up here? Like if you were born in, you know, Kazakhstan, you wouldn't believe this. And he's a materialist atheist. I said, well, that's a fair point. But the truth is, if you were born in Kazakhstan, you wouldn't be a materialist atheist either. We're all a product of environment and evidence and, ra and reason and, and, and different forces. And so what then? Do we just decide, well, kind of it's a lottery? Or is God knowable and, and, and how so? In his book, The Reason for God, Timothy Keller writes that a faith without some doubts is like a human body without antibodies in it. My daughter and I like puns. And when she was a little girl, she said, Dad, do you know why ants are so healthy? Do you know why ants are so healthy? Because they have little antibodies. <laughs> I love that. I know that's nerdy, but I love that. Anyway, back to the quote. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do will find themselves defenseless against the trials of life or the challenges of a very smart skeptic. I think he's exactly right. Keller's saying, Christian, non-Christian, whatever your worldview, if, even if you don't know, like the last young woman in the video, questioning, doubting, wrestling is a good thing. And if God is, if God is real, then he's okay with your questions. Sometimes in the church, we have made the mistake of saying doubts and questions are bad. It means you're questioning your faith. I don't think that's true. I think it's the very thing God can use to bring us to a deeper, fuller knowledge of who he is. And we're hoping that he does that through this series. This is the reason for our series, Explore God, by asking and discussing and wrestling through these questions. Those of us that say we believe would come to a deeper, more assured belief. Those of us, those of you perhaps that are uncertain, still seeking, would come closer to a, an assurance of faith. And those that are skeptics would be challenged in your skepticism. And the, today's question, as I said, is as big as the questions get. Is there a God? Now, even the question itself is a little bit problematic if you think about it. I recently read a book by David Bentley Hart. He's famous for his book called The Atheist Delusion, but perhaps his best uh, book uh, academically is the book The Experience of God, Being, Consciousness, and Bliss. It's the kind of book that you read like three sentences and you have to put it down and go, ah, oh, what did I read? And read it over again and over again. It's really dense, but it's worth the, it's worth the, the slog because there's some great stuff in it. And he says the, what the prime, he spends three chapters defining what we mean when we talk about God, the existence of God. What are we talking about when we talk about God? Just the divine other? Are we talking about some, a being that sort of helps us with our agendas? From the Christian worldview, we're talking about a being that is beyond space, time, and matter. Outside, over, above, in, but outside of, not dependent on the universe. So we're talking about the existence, we, finite beings, are talking about the existence of an infinite being. We contingent beings are talking about the existence of a non-contingent being. We dependent beings are talking about the eternally undependent one. There's a, there, it's a little bit challenging, isn't it, if you think about that? C.S. Lewis writes about this in an essay called God in the Dock. And dock doesn't mean a boat dock. It's the British word for where the defendant would sit uh, in a trial. 
Here's what he writes. Ancient man approached God, or even the gods, as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are quite reversed. He is the judge. God is in the dock. He is quite a kindly judge, and if God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who permits war, poverty, and disease, he's ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal. <laughs> what a line. But the important thing is that man is on the bench and God is in the dock. You see what he's saying? There's a level of hubris that we don't often see when we think about, well, I'll decide if you exist, God. I'll determine if you're there. If he exists, he exists whether you decide so or not. So we need to approach this question with some humility, not as though we're going to put God on trial. The popular idea today, even if it's not stated this way, goes something like this. Those who disbelieve in God or are atheists or even agnostics who don't know, they choose to believe that way based on reason and evidence, rational thought. Those who choose to believe in the existence of God, they do so based on a leap of faith. And, of course, those who are reasonable and make their beliefs based on reason are considered to be more enlightened, highly evolved, more intelligent than those who would take the leap of faith. This is just not true. The reality is that both those who disbelieve and those who believe do so for a combination of reasons, including reason and faith. A common objection to the existence of God I often hear, perhaps you hear, is that God's existence can't be proven scientifically. You should not believe in things that based on 2,000-year-old stories or myths you really should base your life and your beliefs on those things that are objectively verifiable, that can be proven scientifically. But even to make the statement that you should only believe in those things that can be proven scientifically, think about that statement for a minute. You should only believe in those things that can be proven scientifically. Can you prove that statement scientifically? No. Therefore, you should dismiss it and not believe it, right? It, it itself is a statement of belief that you can't prove. For example, I cannot prove to you that I am not a moth dreaming I'm a man. You might laugh, but I can't. I can't prove to you my own existence. You can't prove yours either. We might all be in the matrix, right? How can you prove these things scientifically? They have to be observable, repeatable. We all base our lives on a myriad of things that cannot be proven. Human rights. Can it be proven? Can you prove human rights scientifically? Can you prove the existence of good and evil scientifically? Can you prove love scientifically? No, you can't. But we live as if these things are real. I'm just trying to say, let's make the playing field level here. We talk about the existence of God. How can a being that is bound by space, time, and matter possibly prove the existence of a being that is not bound by space, time, and matter? We, we call these three things, right, a continuum. Scientists say space, time, and matter, there's a continuum there. And they have to come into being at the same time. Because if you have space but no time, when would you put, I mean, that and matter? If you have uh, time and matter but no space, where would you put it? They, they come into existence at the same time. And when we read in Genesis, in the beginning, there's time, God created the heavens, there's space, and the earth, there's matter come into existence at the same time. And we're trying to decide if this God exists. We're not, really, we're not really making the decision based on scientific proof. We're looking at the evidences for whether we're here accidentally, or whether there's an intent and a purpose. Let's ask a different question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why does anything exist at all? Everything in the universe owes its existence to something that pre-existed it or to conditions that had to have pre-existed it. Every, no matter how infinitesimally you slice up matter, no matter how small. I was emailing with a friend named Jesse Badco. Jesse's been baptized in our church, come to faith in Jesus. He's a physicist and engineer at Fermilab. And I was, uh, you know, I was talking to him about some of these things. And he's, I was reading some articles that I didn't understand, so I was asking for his help. And I was saying, you know, don't, protons, electrons, neutrons, we all know about those. Quarks and neutrinos, those are smaller subatomic particles. And I was asking about the Higgs boson. Who's heard of the Higgs boson? It's the so-called God particle. What I found out, which I did not know, is that there's not, it's not actually a particle. 
that the Higgs boson is, um, it's not a particle the way that a neutrino or a quark or an electron is. It's, um, they were colliding uh, subatomic particles into each other so many and so fast and so violently at the subatomic level, trying to break off a piece of what they refer to as the Higgs field, which is sort of the, the gravy of the universe, if you will, like the stuff of the universe, this invisible field that exists. And th to break off a piece and, and measure it. And they have, to, in 2012, they did do that. The Higgs boson. The, physicists don't like the phrase God particle, but the reason that it got coined was to talking about this sort of invisible stuff of the universe that makes up existence and matter. And I asked him, I said, does this change anything in terms of origin? He says, oh, no. Because if you, if you say, well, where the Higgs boson comes from, it comes from the Higgs field. Where the Higgs field comes from, they don't know. No matter how small you slice it, matter doesn't explain its own existence. And, and I, he replied back to me. He said, oh, we're going deep now, Pastor Jeff. It's like you're wanting to cross the event horizon and try to reach the singularity at the center. That's an engineer's way of talking about God. The singularity of the center. I remember reading an article about Ravi Zacharias who was having dinner with a group of physicists and he said to them, what is the Big Bang? Like, just explain it to me in layman's terms. And one of them said to him, it's the, the moment when everything was reduced to a singularity. And Zacharias said, well, you, I've read that at the level of a singularity, all the laws of physics break down. And they said, yes, that's true. And he said, so your starting point is unnatural or, or beyond the natural like mine. How do you explain that? And they said, well, we, this is their quote, we reserve a selective sovereignty over those facts we would like to extrapolate from. <laughs> That's a fancy way of saying we don't know, we just ignore that and make up what we want. I think that's hilarious. However small you slice up matter, you come to the, the question of origins, of existence. David Bentley Hart, in the book I referenced, The Experience of God, writes, at some point then, at the source of all sources and origin of all origins, the contingent must rest on the absolute. In the simplest terms, no contingent reality could exist at all if there were not a necessary dimension of reality sustaining it in existence. And that is the reality to which the word God properly points. Reminds me of the words of the New Testament. All things hold together by a word of his power. Matter is not eternal and matter cannot create itself. We talk about the Big Bang. If you were in your bed at night at 2 a.m. and you heard a Big Bang, or even a little bang for that matter, my guess is you would not go, hmm, interesting, right back to sleep. You'd want to know where did that come from? What caused that? It's not an explanation of existence. Let's look at some evidences then from God's word that we can begin to make sense of the Christian worldview about the existence of God. So we're not talking about scientific proof. We're talking about evidence. First, the evidence of nature. Now we've already been talking about this a little bit, the evidence of the created world, but the evidence of nature. Let's, we're going to spend our time in one psalm, Psalm chapter 19. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. I'm going to read the first four verses to start. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day after day it pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and there are words to the end of the world. Stop there. David, the psalmist, is saying the heavens and the natural world is declaring something. It's saying something to you. Quite literally, it's singing to you and to me. But we don't all see it or hear it. C.S. Lewis writes, A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to acknowledge him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling darkness on the wall of his cell. Because we don't all hear, quote unquote, what the heavens are declaring doesn't mean they are declaring it. This amazing song is all about how God speaks to us and of one of the first and primary ways that God speaks to us is in creation, 
in the natural world. Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul echoes this. He says, for God's divine nature and invisible qualities have been on display through what has been made. We see it. Why does the roar of the ocean thrill us if it does? Why does sun setting over a mountain vista make your heart sore? Why does watching a child sleep make you just marvel at life? Why should a huge ball of gas burning millions of miles away fill you with awe and wonder? Why? You ever stop to think about that? Because nature impacts you the way that good art impacts you. you think about the emotions you feel, the experience you have when you see, uh, when you see a, read a great story, see a fantastic movie, look at a great piece of art, hear a great song. What happens to you? You're moved. You're lifted. Why? Because it's the product of an artistic vision. David is saying, so is nature. Nature is a product of an artistic vision, far beyond any sculptor, painter, musician, artist that you can possibly imagine. And that's why your heart is moved, whatever your worldview. Everything in nature is singing and saying, declaring, we're not an accident. We're not here by accident. Someone made us and put us on display. Francis Collins was the director of the Human Genome Project and mapped the human DNA and uh, wrote a book called The Language of God. He came to be a, a deist, then a theist, then a Christian through his own study of human DNA. And you'll see here, if, um, well, he, he writes this. He says, we live on the knife edge of improbability. The unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics itself points to the existence of God. There was no particular reason why all the events in the universe should follow simple mathematical equations, but they do. And he said that when he began to look into the, the mapping, the human DNA, the human gene, he said that he was, felt like he was looking at the, at the book of life, the very writings of God. You can see an image here on the screen. This image is of the rose window at York Minster Cathedral in England. It's massive. Anybody ever been there and seen it? It's incredible, huge, and, and perfect in its symmetry and its beauty. And when the sun hits it, it's, uh, it's, I've never seen it. I hope to go. I'm going to go to England soon. I'm going to make a pilgrimage, right? It's said to be like just an awe-inspiring sight. This next image here, this is a picture of the human, human double helix DNA cut uh, horizontally looking down the long axis. Now put those two together. You see one and you think, you do not think the wind made this window. This is clearly the product of incredible artistic vision. It's clearly there because someone with brilliance and skill designed it to thrill us, to make our hearts soar. Francis Collins says when he saw this, symmetry, beauty, glory, the product of artistic vision. We are the product of artistic vision. There is no higher view of nature than the Christian view. Elizabeth Elliot writes, a clam glorifies God better than you because the clam is being everything it was created to be, whereas we often are not. That's funny and pithy, but it's brilliant. A clam, a rock, a tree glorifies God better than you. Why? Because it's doing what it was created to do. One of the unique things about being a human being is we have a choice in the matter. And many of us are not living as we're created to be. We're not always being that. And this points us to the second thing I want to say from Psalm 19, the evidence of morality. We could spend hours on the evidence of nature. But the evidence of morality... Let's look at the next few verses from Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. David moves from what the heavens and the na natural world is saying to what the law of God is saying. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Now, the first part of the psalm is telling you about the natural world, what God is saying to you in the soundless word in nature. 
And it's like nonverbal communication from God. You can know something about his nature and his divine qualities. But there's a difference between nonverbal communication and, and verbal. I, I can look at my wife, or better yet, she can look at me, and I can know what she's thinking. She has a way of communicating with me without saying words. Some of you husbands know what I'm talking about, right? And, and we understand that when you know somebody well. But if, if my wife wanted to tell me, Jeff, pick up milk and uh, coffee candies, which she loves at Trader Joe's, and be home by 3.30, you can't do that nonverbally, can you? You, you, there's no look that communicates all that. So David is saying, some things about God can be known in the natural world, but, the, but God wants you to specifically know him, and he's done that through his word, through his law. Listen again to the words used to describe the law. Perfect, sure, right, pure, clean, true, righteous altogether. There, there's a deep down sense in the human heart that we long for something that's clean and true and right and pure and righteous altogether. And there's also, if we're honest with ourselves, a deep down sense in the human heart that we are not clean, true, pure, right, and righteous altogether. We know that. We are not, and this world is not, as it ought to be. I don't think I have to convince you of that. We have a sense that all is not as it should be. Where does that sense come from? If there's no God, if God does not exist, if you are the accidental process, random collocation of atoms, the process of natural selection, and when you die, you're worm food, and that is it, and eventually this amazing universe which thrills us is going to burn up when it reaches maximum entropy, and the, the, when we reach the heat death of the universe, it's going to grow cold and dark and die. And your life is not only going to be forgotten, it's going to be irrelevant. In that sense. Where in the world would this sense of it ought to be different come from? Where would we get the word ought at all? Sociologist Christian Smith says morality is an understanding about what is right, wrong, just, unjust that is not established by our own actual desires and preferences, but instead are believed to exist apart from them, providing the standards by which our own desires and preferences should be judged. I don't think there's any such thing as a, a truly consistent moral relativist. You know what a moral relativist is? So all morality is man-made, and it's relative. It's it's not. It's subjective and relative. It's not objectively. You can't. It's not. There's no divine objective standard. It's cultural and so, societally based, and it's relative. I don't know if, if if a moral relativist has his or her children threatened. I don't believe they say, you you know you. I prefer you don't do that. That's not practical for a human being to live that way. They say, that's wrong. You should not do it. Where does this come from? Where does the ought in the human heart come from? Bertrand Russell, famous materialist and atheist, writes, I cannot live as though ethical values are purely a matter of personal preference. And I do not know the solution to this. Isn't that telling? I cannot live as though moral and ethical values are purely a matter of personal preference. And I do not know what to do about this because I don't believe that there is a moral objective standard, he's saying. But he also recognizes he's honest enough, intellectually honest enough to say, this is a hard way to live. Atheist author Richard Dawkins, who's one of the new atheists and, and often quoted, has actually gone so far as to say that in order to maintain the materialist worldview in coherence, we must be willing to deny the existence of objective evil. Wow. You follow that? He says, if we want to be consistent as an atheist and a materialist, then we've got to say there really is no such thing as good and evil, objectively. There's only preference here and now. But it actually, I put it this way, I think it takes more faith to be a materialist, atheist, and to believe in human rights, good and evil. Because if you're a Hindu, then morality, good and evil, fits into your worldview. I want to behave according to the code so that I can be reincarnated up the chain. If you're a Muslim, I think morality, good and evil, right and wrong, fits into your worldview. It, certainly if you're a Christian, it fits in better. If you're a believer, if you believe in God, however you define him, the morality fits better. But if you're an atheist humanist, that, that's logically incoherent. Now, 
evolutionary biologists and atheists often work hard to try to find some basis for morality outside of acknowledging any divine standard. And one of the leading ways of talking about it is that, well, human societies down through the centuries have, you know, banded together. And in that, in that community, in, in that collection of human beings, they've discovered that it's better to be selfless and to serve other people and to work together, to be cooperative. And so then this, this is passed on through their, their genes, that this is the way that we should behave. There's so many flaws with that. One glaring one is that might explain tribalism. That might explain why my tribe treats the people in my tribe with respect and self-sacrifice. But it doesn't explain why my tribe wants to kill and eat that tribe. It just doesn't explain it. The evidence of morality does not prove the existence of God. The material universe does not prove the existence of God. The Yale Law professor Arthur Left writes, a, wrote an essay called The Grand Says Who. Remember when you were a kid in the playground? Says who? Right? What's the authority? He has this brilliant essay called The Grand Says Who. Like, we're really asking the question, that's, that's not right. That should not be. It's wrong to oppress the, the, and exploit the poor. Says who? It's wrong to mistreat children. Says who? It's wrong to abuse women. Says who? Where does it come from? Why do we say these things? Why do we feel these things? We live in a culture of outrage. It, it's, all, it's hard to pay attention to what we're supposed to be outraged about. But it's no secret that we live, even if we would disagree about some of the minutia, we know that they're right and wrong. Says who? Where does it come from? How many of you know the, the blind men and the elephant parable? Have you heard this? The blind men and the elephant parable goes like this. It's, it's used to talk about how we, how we have limited knowledge and nobody can really know. Agnostics like to use this. And agnostic, if you're wondering, is someone who says, I don't know if there's a God. I don't believe it's knowable. An atheist is someone who says there is no God. The, leave the blind man for a minute. To be a, to be a consistent atheist is a, is a challenging thing. It's, it's, a, it's a rather arrogant claim. Often what has been told to Christians is, you, you, how arrogant of you to think you know that the God exists. But if you think logically about it, actually the more arrogant claim is to say that God does not exist emphatically. If I told you that I lost my wallet and, and I looked for it in the backyard, I think I lost it there, but I, but I look and it's not in the backyard. To, to know that for certain, which by the way has happened to me on more than one occasion. <laughs> it's, it's not in the backyard. I'd have to have absolute, not, I'd have to be omnipotent about my backyard. I'd have to know every blade of grass, every bark chip, every tree, every branch, every plant, every rock, every plank in our deck, every piece of gravel under the deck. I'd have to have infinite, perfect knowledge of the entire backyard for me to say with certainty it is not in the backyard. All I and I don't have that. That's just my little quarter acre backyard. All I can really say is I have not seen it in my backyard. I looked and I can't find it. I don't think it's in the backyard. That's the best I could do. But to say it's not there is the height of arrogance. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah, the blind man and the elephant. Okay, this is often used this way. That, that one blind man is at the trunk of the elephant, and he feels the trunk, and he says, and, and he says God is, is ultimate reality, and God is, is flexible and long. And another blind man is at the rear of the elephant, and he's grabbing onto one of the legs. He says, no, 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 ultimate reality is solid and round and rough. And another blind man is the tusk of the elephant says, no, no, God is smooth and pointy on the end and, and curved. And the, what the point is what? They all have a piece of knowledge, but not the whole thing. And this is used to say, like, you know, they're trying to describe what an elephant is like. And if you use this to talk about what God is like, it's like, well, you know, the best we could hope for is some partial knowledge. But nobody can claim to know infinite reality. We're finite beings. And so we, we really, all you can know, hope to know is a little bit of reality. And it takes all different faiths and viewpoints to sort of approximate what it might be like. Now, th th there's a problem with this. Leslie Newbegin, who was a, a British missiologist and lived in India and a brilliant writer, uh, he, he wrote about engaging a postmodern culture. And he says, the problem with this story, which is often uh, used to talk about how uh, we should not claim to know anything about ultimate reality, is often overlooked, is that this story is told from the point of view of someone who is not blind, but can see what the blind men cannot. The only one who could see the whole elephant 
only the one who could see the whole elephant could know that the rest of them only are seeing part of it or feeling, experiencing part of it. This story has the appearance of humility in the claim that the truth is greater than any of us can possibly know. But it is, in fact, an arrogant claim to the kind of knowledge that is superior, which you have just said no one religion has. Do you catch it? You could, this story only makes sense if somebody sees the whole elephant. Otherwise, how would you know they're blind? And how would you know they see part of it? It's an arrogant assumption that you poor religious people only see part of it. But I see the whole thing, and therefore I'm telling you that you have limited knowledge. But you, we hear it as if it's, it's, a, it's, it's a humble claim. It's meant to sort of put those who have religious faith in their place. Now, the point is, God is either knowable or he's not. You either can know who he is or he's not. When Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin returned from space and reported that he had not found God there, C.S. Lewis responded brilliantly that this was like Hamlet going in the attic of his castle looking for Shakespeare. <laughs> if there's a God, he wouldn't be another object in the universe that could be put in a lab and analyzed with empirical methods. He would relate to us the way a playwright relates to the characters in his play. We, the characters, might be able to know quite a lot about the playwright, but only to the degree that the author chooses to put information about himself in the play. The only way Hamlet could know Shakespeare personally is if Shakespeare decided to write himself into the play. Right? Otherwise, he, he cannot know. Now, I want to bring us to the last section here called the evidence of hope. We, we can't just leave things here at the theoretical level. If we only talk about the evidence of nature and the evidence of morality and the existence of God and theism versus atheism and deism, and that's good as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough to give us the Christian perspective. Let me read to you the last couple of verses of Psalm 19, verses 12 through 14. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I want you to focus on that last word there, redeemer. David, writing long before Jesus walked the earth, is saying the heavens declare something about God. The word of God makes him, his person and his character known to us in the moral code and in his law. But even beyond that, he's my redeemer. There's a future hope there for David. That somehow God would redeem his life and forgive his sins. If we just leave it at the theoretical level, at the philosophical level, that's not what the Bible is, whose the Bible is saying God is. God is not distant or detached. He's not just merely the first cause or the unmoved mover somewhere off in beyond the universe, arms folded, the, like the clockmaker who wound it all up and let it go. I often hear people say things to me like, I can't believe in a God who dot, dot, dot. And the, one of the objections you heard in the video, which is who would allow such evil and suffering, and we're going to address that question next week. But I often hear people say, I can't believe in a God who whatever. I, I want to say with all my heart, tell me about the God you say you can't believe in. Because the chances are I don't believe in that God either. Which is not the God of the Bible. But let me tell you about the God that I do believe in. I believe in the God who is revealed in space, time, and history. Who you can trace out his divine qualities in all that exists. From the subatomic particles to a mountain view to the stars in the heavens. I believe in the God who spoke the universe into existence by word of his power and who holds all things together. I believe in the God who made us in his image and who cares about every life from, from the womb to the classroom to the boardroom to the hospital room awaiting death. I believe in the God who calls people out of darkness and into light. The God who called Abraham to follow him and trust him and who said to Abraham and his wife Sarah when she was very old, out of the deadness and barrenness of your womb, I'm going to bring new life which will be for the blessing of all nations. I believe in the God who delivered his people out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt so they could worship him and he delivers us out of the bondage of sin and self-sufficiency so that we could worship him and serve him. 
I believe in the God who delivered his people. And I believe in the God that is still calling people and delivering them today. And I believe in the God who does not stand aloof or distant from this world, or is disinterested in this world, but is present, so present that he was willing to send his son into the world to live the life we could not live. Remember the ought, I ought to be better than I am. Look to Jesus, who is better than you will ever be, and gives you his righteousness to redeem this world through his sacrificial death, and who promises hope through his glorious resurrection. I believe in this God. You, you want to talk about the, the concept of, of the divine and stand at a distance and philosophize about abstract content, con, have at it. I want to tell you about the God who is Father, Son, and Spirit, who's knowable, who knows you, who exists whether you acknowledge him or not, and not only exists with arms folded hoping you stumble around the dark and find him, but is making himself known to you. David says, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, it's, he's constantly singing to you. And not just non-verbally, because that's easy to miss. He's given you his revealed written word about his very character and nature. And not only this, he's given you himself, his son, when David says, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I think it takes far more faith to live in this world as if moral values and duties exist and not believe in a God. To live in a world full of beauty and wonder and not believe in a God. None of this proves scientifically that God exists. But here's the challenge. I know most of you in this room already believe 99.9999% of the things I just said. Here's your challenge. Do you live that way? Do you live as if God is an ever-present reality? Do you live your life as if all nature is singing about who he is? Do you live your life as if he's made his character and his will known to you? Do you align yourself with that? Do you live your life as if he is your hope, your redemption and your hope? I think there are a lot of functional atheists in the church who intellectually say, God's real. Amen, pastor. And get up Monday morning and live as if he's not. Behave as if he's not. Make our decisions as if he's not real. Or if he's, 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 he's just distant. I just want to challenge you. Does your life reflect not just the existence, but the personal presence of God? And for those of you who might still be in process and are questioning and wrestling with these things, there's so much more than I have yet given you. But go, go home and read Psalm 19 and ask yourself why your heart thrills at a sunset, why you have this deep sense that the world should be better than it is, and where is your hope? God is real, friends. He's present right now. Let's pray. Father God, it's, we began by asking the question, how could finite beings ask, determine the existence of the infinite? And we could not. We would be lost unless you decided to make yourself known to us, which is what you have done. You've written your glory in the heavens. You've written your glory in your word. And you want to write your glory across our hearts if we will yet trust you. O oh Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. We praise you, not just for existing, but for who you are, for your character, nature, love, grace, and mercy present in the person of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.